Avengers Endgame put a ton of heroes and villains together on the big screen. But it doesn't even scratch the surface when it comes to the sheer volume of characters that exist in the Marvel Universe. Here are a few characters you didn't know once graced the pages of a Marvel comic. Sure, kids love toys, but turning a bunch of goofy robot action figures into an epic storyline? That's no walk in the park. Back in the 80s, Hasbro really wanted to develop a detailed background story for their 26 mutating robot toys, the Transformers, but didn't know where to start. So they went to Marvel for help. Yes, Marvel. Or to be precise, Marvel editor Bob Budiansky created most of the classic Transformers names, characters, and story elements that you know today. Once Budiansky's Transformers mythology was developed, Marvel then premiered all these robotic heroes and villains in their own Transformers comic series, where the Autobots were portrayed as heroes in the same universe as the Avengers. As early as the third issue, Optimus Prime, Gears, and company teamed up with Spider-Man. Cool as it might be to imagine the Autobots rolling out to battle Thanos, though, it was never meant to last. Hasbro still held the rights, Marvel eventually stopped putting out comics, and the two canons have mostly been separate ever since outside of occasional team-ups like the 2007 comic New Avengers Transformers. If you go poking through those old Marvel handbooks, you'll find Frankenstein-inspired characters all over the place. The Hulk is the obvious one, but there's also the thing in Ultron. Strings, but now I'm free. And even the Punisher got Frankenstein at one point. However, the actual creature created by Mary Shelley in 1818 was also incorporated into the Marvel Universe. Marvel's take on Frankenstein's monster is actually far more faithful to the source material than the old Universal Studios flicks ever were. Marvel's creature is the same clever, tragic figure that Shelley first wrote about, unlike the Boris Karloff version, and this monster experiences all the same events depicted in the novel, right up until the end, of course, where he ends up running into a bunch of surviving Neanderthals in the Arctic Circle, getting stuck in an earthquake, and then being frozen in ice a la Captain America because... Marvel? These days, the creature usually calls himself Frank, and he has become a proper superhero, known for teaming up with fellow quirky outsiders like Howard the Duck and She-Hulk. When you hear the name Conan the Barbarian, you probably picture a shirtless Arnold Schwarzenegger in his prime chopping off heads. What is best in life? To crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and to hear the lamentation of your women. However, this ancient warrior didn't originate on film, but rather in a series of pulp stories by Robert E. Howard in the 1930s. Howard died in 1936, and Conan died with him, until the 1970s when Marvel Comics scooped up the old character's rights, transferred Howard's stories into comic book form, and made Conan the pop culture icon he is today. In fact, according to Sci-Fi, Marvel's influence on the 1982 Schwarzenegger film was so prevalent that at one point, the comics writer Roy Thomas even worked on the movie's screenplay. Lest you believe that Marvel merely publishes Conan comics separately from their main line, though, fear not. Thanks to some time travel shenanigans, Conan has met heroes like Ant-Man and Thor, and though the comics publisher lost the Conan rights for a few decades, they eventually got them back. These days, the Barbarian Warrior can now be found teaming up with anti-heroes like Wolverine, Venom, and Elektra. Whenever Conan the Barbarian comes up in conversation, his ally, Red Sonja, usually isn't far behind. Arnold Schwarzenegger even co-starred in the 1985 Red Sonja spin-off starring Brigitte Nielsen, and in recent years, big names ranging from Robert Rodriguez to Amber Tamblyn have struggled to get a reboot off the ground. At one point, Rose McGowan was even set to play the role of everyone's favorite she-devil with a sword. Funny thing, though, Red Sonja wasn't part of Robert E. Howard's pulp stories. She's a Marvel Comics creation. Red Sonja first appeared in the 1973 comic Conan the Barbarian No. 23 by Roy Thomas and Barry Windsor Smith, and she was created mainly because Howard's original tales didn't have anything in the way of strong and or developed female characters. Proving to be almost as popular as Conan, Red Sonja earned her own solo comic along with that aforementioned feature film, and she eventually teamed up with Spider-Man 2. Bizarrely enough, Sonya's unexpected popularity led to her rights ending up in the hands of Dynamite Entertainment, which is why even though Marvel recently got Conan back, they're now barred from using Red Sonya. Copyright disputes can cause wacky things. Just ask Shazam, or don't actually because that's a long story. Instead, take a look at Angela, the Divine Image Comics anti-hero who first appeared in Spawn No. 9 in 1993. 
Created by Neil Gaiman and Todd McFarlane, Angela was originally portrayed as an angel sent to kill Spawn who later discovered that her existence had been woven from the souls of sacrificed women. Angela proved to be a popular character, but she eventually got terminated by Malabolgia, at which point she was resurrected in, uh, the Marvel Universe? Yep, Angela is a Marvel character now. Newsarama reports that this was the result of a decade-long legal dispute between McFarlane and Gaiman which saw Gaiman taking the character's rights to Marvel. Given that Marvel has its own cosmic mythology, it's only natural that Angela's origins had to be a tad reworked, so she's now portrayed as the long-lost sister of Thor and Loki. In recent years, she has spent her time as a member of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Another Hasbro toy line, another Marvel comic, another super-confusing, reality-warping, canonical mind-screw. Much of the classic G.I. Joe lore that fans know today, you know, Duke, Snake Eyes, all that stuff, came courtesy of Marvel writer Larry Hama. While the G.I. Joe crew didn't usually get all that mixed up with the traditional Marvel heroes like Transformers did. That said, Duke did once pop up in an issue of The Amazing Spider-Man. More notably, Marvel claims credit for the first ever crossover between G.I. Joe and Transformers, a feat that IDW has since replicated. IDW's 2010 comic G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero does pick up the Larry Hama continuity, but presumably eschews any Marvel connections. We are in a toy commercial! I can't hear you when you're covered in raw! It doesn't hurt because it isn't real. One rather amusing anecdote about G.I. Joe is that many of Hama's story concepts were originally created for a different, unpublished comic. Titled Fury Force, according to comic book resources, the comic would have depicted Nick Fury's son leading an elite strike squad. Though Fury Force never saw the light of day, Hama repurposed these ideas to fit the G.I. Joe team. Considering that he went on to write the book for 12 years and over 150 issues, it seems like things worked out for the best. Yo, Joe! Forget about that Drake crap in Blade Trinity. In the comics, Marvel's Dracula is the real Dracula, and he's the cloak-wearing, powerful, nightmarish supervillain you'd expect with a healthy blend of Bram Stoker's original concepts and Bela Lugosi's theatrics. Rather than guest starring in somebody else's book, the world's most infamous fanged supervillain hit the four colored pages in the 1972 comic Tomb of Dracula by Jerry Conway and Gene Colan. In the years that the great vampire actively menaced the Marvel world, he crossed paths with such notable heroes as Spider-Man, Doctor Strange, the X-Men, and Howard the Duck. The heroes who really stuck in Dracula's craw were people like Blade and Hannibal King, who both premiered within Tomb of Dracula's pages. Considering that Dracula is actually a classic Marvel villain, Blade Trinity had no excuse to portray him so poorly. Maybe the MCU will give him another chance someday? If nothing else, it's a good excuse to see more Howard the Duck. What do you let it lick you like that for? Gross. Yep, the X-Men and the Enterprise crew have encountered each other a few times. To be fair though, the stories themselves acknowledge that both camps come from separate realities, which is kind of obvious, considering that there aren't any mutants enlisted in the United Federation of Planets. But just try to convince us that this interdimensional crossover isn't a part of both Marvel continuity and Star Trek continuity. Besides, it led to some iconic moments. The first time that Marvel's mutants appeared on the bridge of the Enterprise, for example, Spock took down Wolverine with a good old Vulcan nerve pinch. Luckily for Logan, he fared better when they journeyed to the era of Star Trek The Next Generation, where he was able to bond with the equally cranky Worf. The X-Men and Next Generation crew met a second time in an authorized 90s novel by Michael Jan Friedman, in which Data and Banshee sing duets, Geordi chills with Nightcrawler, and Captain Picard and Professor Xavier amuse themselves by remarking on their uncanny resemblance. Keep in mind, this book was published years before Patrick Stewart nabbed the latter role. Maybe somebody in Hollywood was taking notes? From TV to films and even video games, you really can't understate the influence that H.P. Lovecraft's cosmic horror stories have had on popular fiction, and the Marvel Universe is chock full of Lovecraftian terrors that would send shivers down your spine. Cthulhu himself is part of Marvel's dark, multi-dimensional pantheon, and while little is known about this particular incarnation of the great tentacled Elder God, he has occasionally appeared in darker titles like Moon Knight and Doctor Strange. He has never played a central role, though his children have. One X-Men story involving the Phoenix Force featured a ghastly monster called the Dweller in Darkness, portrayed as a spawn of Cthulhu who wanted to demolish reality. Do it for the old man, son. Other characters from Lovecraft's Cthulhu mythos, or references to them, have popped up in Marvel stories for decades. For example, 
Yogg Sothoth appeared in a number of Conan the Barbarian comics. Doctor Strange once even had a copy of the Necronomicon. Marvel's characters might be likable folks with relatable stories, but their universe certainly has some creepy corners. One of the craziest Marvel storylines in the 70s involved the giant scaly mofo Godzilla himself busting free from an iceberg and stomping across the United States. On its way, the creature encountered such standard Marvel obstacles as S.H.I.E.L.D., the Avengers, and the Fantastic Four. Yup, you heard that right, Godzilla himself tussled with Marvel's heroes, and the results were just as bonkers as you'd hope. According to Sci-Fi, Marvel struck a deal with kaiju wizards at Toho to bring Godzilla to their pages, and since they couldn't afford to license any of Godzilla's usual monster opponents, they instead kept the beast preoccupied with superheroes like Iron Man, the Fantastic Four, and the Vision. Writer Doug Munch went pretty much all out in every issue, at one point having Hank Pym shrink Godzilla down to the size of a rat, and even including a scene where cranky old J. Jonah Jameson yells at Godzilla outside his window. Marvel eventually lost the big guy's comic rights, but because the universe can be sorta of rad sometimes, all of these stories have remained in continuity. What, Captain America's shield in the background of every episode wasn't a big enough clue? When I reported on the tragic death of Captain America, I criticized him for dissenting with the Federal Superhero Registration Act. I just think if the government wants to track your every move, you should be flattered. Sure, Stephen Colbert is a real person, but the pompous, egomaniacal guy who hosted the Colbert Report was a fictional character, not at all like the real dude, and this fictionalized Colbert is actually a relatively major figure in the Marvel Universe. You see, Colbert ran as a third-party candidate for U.S. president in Marvel's version of the 2008 election, and he was immensely popular with the Marvel populace. Truthiness for the win! Colbert mostly appeared in various Spider-Man comics, at one point even getting tangled up in a fight with the Grizzly, a B-grade bad guy who wears a dumb teddy bear costume, which resulted in the web-slinger having to rescue him. Filled with the same self-importance as his TV character, Marvel's Colbert presumed that Grizzly must have been sent by the Red Skull or Kingpin as an assassination attempt. If TV Colbert and comics Colbert are the same, is every episode of The Colbert Report set in the Marvel Universe too? Timelines sure get confusing. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.